Welcome to today's episode of the podcast. I'm really excited to share today's guest's story with you all. And before we jump in, I'd really appreciate if you could take a moment and rate the podcast on Spotify or on Apple. And this is going to allow the podcast to reach more people. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and today I'm joined by Alan Meisner. So myself and Alan came across each other on a online uh, mentorship program, the Online Trainer Mentorship. And Alan did a training for all of the other trainers through that about how to start and run your own successful podcast. So that kind of gave me the nudge to start my own podcast. And now I'm, in, uh, now I'm interviewing him. So he's got lots of things going on. I'm really excited to pick his brain. So Alan, why don't we start with a bit about yourself, who you are and uh, what you do day to day? Well, uh, I do a lot of things, but uh, you know, my name is Alan Meisner. Uh, I've been an online coach now for about uh, six and a half years. Uh, so I started doing online training long before it was really popular, long before COVID, long before a lot of this. Um, and so for me, uh, what I was looking for when I was unhealthy was how, how do I get myself healthy? And I was traveling about 90%. So if you're a busy executive, you kind of understand what that's all about. Uh, you're never in one place. You can't meet with a trainer, uh, gym to gym to gym. You don't know what pieces of equipment you're going to have available to you in any given day. Uh, so I couldn't fall back on the things that I'd always fall, fallen back on in the past. So I started working on my certifications to train myself. So I became my personal trainer by getting certified through National Academy of Sports Medicine, getting their corrective, uh, corrective exercise specialty, getting their nutrition specialty. Uh, and now I've also gotten behavioral change. Um, and I also am working on my P PN uh, start. And so uh, I just started working on improving my own knowledge. So I was reading a lot of books. I was doing a lot of things. And I became my own coach and I dropped 66 pounds of fat, gained 11 pounds of muscle. Uh, and I did this when I was 47 years old, um, which, you know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, you're over the hill. You're not going to be able to do this. Uh, no, I got freaking strong. I got really conditioned and was in really good shape. Uh, good enough that I could run a Tough mutter with my 21 year old CrossFit coach daughter. Uh, and not slow her down. You know, that was the goal, it, 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 you know, make that happen. And so I became my own coach. Of course, you do these kind of things and, and you're just posting about your life and people are like, you're, you're 47 years old. You're not supposed to be doing tough mutters. Um, what are you doing? How are you doing this? Um, and so I started answering questions and I realized, you know, I had to do this all by myself and other, and it took me a long, long time, really, when I look at when I wanted to make the change and when I did make the change and I thought it shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't, the information is out there, but it's so scattered and it's so much of it. It really shouldn't be that hard for people to put together what I did. And so I started a podcast because there were no podcasts that focused on anyone over the age of 40. And everybody you talked to was, oh, well, this is how you do it. And I'm like, no, that, that works very well if you're 25. You know, that works really well when you're 25, when everything's working and you don't have broken bits and you haven't gotten detrained, uh, that works really well. When you're over 40, uh, it's a different ball game. It's a different thing. And so to fix myself, to get that, I mean, to, because of what I did, then I felt like I needed to pass that on. So I did start the podcast. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I, I still have this corporate job that is paying me very well. So I'll, I'll take a couple clients on the side, nothing major. Um, and I was doing that. And what the plan was, okay, well, I'll, I'll finish that in about five years. I'll finish this corporate job and then I'll have this podcast and I'll have some clients and then I'll just roll this over into a personal training business. So the plan was always to do that, but I got laid off about three years early uh, from when that was. And it just came down to well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back and try to get another corporate job and, and do what I was doing on the side? Or will I just make this work? And I decided I was going to make it work. And that involved a movement, a move because I wanted to go to a place where the cost of living was lower. So as a digital nomad, because most of my business is online now, um, I could go anywhere. So we chose a small island in uh, the Caribbean uh, as part of Panama. It's called Boca del Toro. Um, and so I, I wear shorts and tank tops every day. 
Uh, I don't have to bundle up or do any of that kind of stuff. And I did end up buying a gym down here and I run my online training. I have the podcast and my wife and I bought a bed and breakfast. So uh, my days are pretty full, but that's how I got where I was from being a corporate guy to uh, now being an online personal trainer. Wow. I just assumed that you'd been doing PT for like 20 years and uh, I had no idea that you were you know, it was just kind of like a side gig. So you said you're 47. That's when you met. Is that when you got the results or when you started making the shift that, and doing the I, certifications? I, well, the, the, the decision. So that I'll put it this way for a lot of us, when we're going to make a change, we make a decision. So you'll wake up. Uh, sometimes it's January 1st. You know, I made the decision. I'm going to change my whole life. Um, I made the decision uh, when I was like 39. I was like, I'd gotten out of shape. Uh, I, w- I, was, I was very athletic. I was in the gym all the time in my 20s, and then I kind of fell out of it. So there's about a decade there of not training, of not eating well, not treating my body right. Uh, and it, it showed. Uh, I was in terrible shape, terrible health. And I was, so I was 39 when I made a decision. Uh, and then I spent eight years trying to figure this stuff out. You know, I, I bought the insanity tapes, you know, from... Uh, uh, beach body. And I, I did the, the first little test, just the test, the, you know, get your conditioning test. And I couldn't get out of bed the next morning. I had to call off sick because I could not get out of bed. I felt like someone had beat me with a baseball bat overnight. Um, and so just kept making these mistakes and making these mistakes and falling backwards and falling backwards. But I was, I was in a bad place again. And I'd, so I'd up and down, up and down for eight years when again, at 47 years old, I said, you know, every other thing that I've been successful at in my life came not because I made a decision, but because I made a commitment. You know, when I took the CPA exam, which is what uh, you you call them chartered accountants, I believe, but in the United States are called certified public accountants. When I took that exam, you know, it was only 10% of the people pass it on the first try. And I made the commitment, no, I'm, I'm going to pass it on the first try. And I did. And everything that I've ever been really successful at was because of the commitment I made before I did it. And I said, well, this has to be the same. For me to be successful in improving my health and fitness, I have to commit to it. 100%, this is who I am, what I'm going to be. And that came at 47. Uh, and basically, most people will look at pictures of me uh, in March of that year, and they'll say, okay, uh, you don't look so bad, but that was after December. So starting from November to basically November, so about a one-year period of time, I dropped the 66 pounds of fat, and I put on 11 pounds of muscle. And I went from someone who couldn't play a single game of volleyball without getting winded to someone who could run a Tough mutter and keep up with the 20-year-olds. Um, and it's possible for anybody to do that kind of change um, if they commit. Mm. Yeah, mate, that's massive. And I, I think something I've been having this conversation with a few other trainers, but also clients as well, who they might talk to their friends and a lot of them are, yeah, kind of, you know, over 40 most of these people who were, who were, who I'm talking about. And sometimes the attitude is, or the belief is that it's kind of, it's, this is just the way it is now. There's kind of nothing I can do. So if there's something, someone watching this, they might, or listening to this, they might say, well, you know, you're a PT or X, Y, and Z. So it's easier for you. Like what advice would you give to someone who maybe is in the position you were in back when you were 47 or 39, 47, they're feeling really stuck. They're not really happy. Their energy is really low. What would you recommend them to do? And that's where I was. And I was traveling 90% of the time all around the world, different gyms, different places, uh, hotel bars, every hotel, uh, you know, how do you get yourself to stop doing the behaviors? Um, and it's really, it comes down to that one word commitment. Uh, why do you want to do this? So what I was looking at and realizing that I was, I was basically killing myself. If I didn't make a change to the way I was living, I was on an aging curve that was going to end in me being sick and old fast and not being the person I thought I should be. And I 
looked at the people in my life, which at the time was just my daughter. And I said, look, uh, she's doing these things. She's a CrossFit coach now reminding me of who I was when I was in my twenties, you know, she's mini me trying to be a, you know, a personal trainer. She's, you know, doing the CrossFit. And then she's telling me, Hey, there's this competition. Will you come watch? And I'm thinking to myself, why, why would I just watch my daughter do something like this? Why wouldn't I do it with her? So in looking at my why, it was this emotional, I want to be a part of my daughter's life, not as a spectator, but in her life doing these things. And so it was bigger than me. It was bigger than just saying, I need to do this, or I should do this, or my doctor tells me I should do this. This was, I have to be the person that I want to be for my daughter. And the vision was then, hey, let's do this. We did a warrior dash, which is a shorter version of the Tough Mudder. It's a, like 5K with some obstacles. We did that. Um, and that was tough, but not, not so bad. And then I just wanted a, a bigger challenge. My daughter had no problem with that. And I said, well, what do you think about a Tough Mudder? You know, these are like 13 miles with 25 obstacles. Uh, so these are big deals. These, these are tough ones, uh, which I've actually signed up for another one now. Uh, so when we get to talking about my training today, uh, it's going to be ab about getting ready for another one um, <laughs> at 56. Um, but it's, that's the whole thing is like, I, I wanted to be there with my daughter and I'm going to be there for my grandchildren. And I don't, we didn't have tough. And I was going to. Uh, with other stuff we did. I don't know what my grandkids are going to be wanting to do, but I want to be there doing it with them. I don't want to be a spectator in their life. And if you don't make things go right, your body is capable of change, but you got to start. And the start and the stick comes from the commitment. Yeah, mate, that's good advice. And like having the commitment and then having like a deep why. So obviously you, your daughter, your family wanting to be there for them. Now you said you're 56. So this is like yeah. year nine. Is it of the kind of transformation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's been all plain sailing. I'm sure it's just been like up and to the right. No, no, <laughs> no setbacks. <laughs> can you maybe talk about maybe no, some well, failures they're, you've they're, experienced they're, that maybe people can yeah. resonate with? Yeah. Well, um, I decided that I was going to do a, I was going to suppose 51. So about five years ago, four or five years ago, uh, I was, uh, I wanted to do a Spartan, you know, cause I'd heard they're a little tougher than the tough mutters. And so I, I got my brother to agree to sign up and it turned out he wasn't able to go. Uh, but I was training for this and I hired a trainer. Um, and, um, you know, for one reason or another ego got in my way. Uh, I was getting stronger and stronger. In fact, at 51, I was stronger than I'd ever been in my entire life. Um, and so here I am one day with some 80 pound dumbbells doing seated military press. And I go to pull the dumbbells up and pop. There goes the shoulder, uh, tore a rotator cuff. Okay. And so I'm, I'm about a month out from the the Spartan. And I know I've just tore the rotator cup. I, I I'm pretty sure I, I tore all the way off at this point, uh, just based on what I was able to do from a movement pattern. Um, and again, my experience of knowing, okay, what are movement patterns and how should a shoulder work? Uh, that went a long way for me to knowing exactly. I'm not a doctor, but I'll self-diagnose every day. Um, and so I knew I'd done it, but I also knew, okay, since it's torn, uh, I can't, tear it more <laughs> store. Uh, and so, uh, I went ahead and did the Spartan with a torn rotator cuff and then went in, got the surgery, did the PT. In fact, I had the surgery on a Thursday uh, with one of the best surgeons I could find. Uh, I hired one of the best, uh, physical therapists I could find. He actually had worked with the uh, local college university football team, uh, American football team. Um, and, uh, I was in PT on Monday, I had the surgery on Thursday, we had PT on Monday and I had worked out every day, right up until surgery, uh, moving my arm in the ranges of motion that it could move. Obviously I couldn't, I couldn't do any pushing movements, but, uh, I could do pulls. I could do everything else. So from a range of motion, I had maintained that. 
uh, because again, the why was still there. I still wanted to be able to do that Spartan. I still wanted to be able to recover from this injury. Uh, so the same why carried me through the surgery, carried me through physical therapy. Uh, and then, you know, looking at my whys and saying, okay, do I need to be pressing 80 pounds over my head? Uh, you know, 80, 280, 280 pound dumbbells over my head. And the short answer is no, uh, I actually don't. Uh, the heaviest thing I've ever had to put over my head was a 25 pound luggage in an overhead bin. Um, <laughs> and then behind that's a, a jar of jar of pickles in the up care, up care cabinet, you know? So just thinking in terms of physically, what do I want to be capable of doing as I get older? Uh, I have a joke that I say that it's, it's a true, it's a true statement. And if you take this to heart, I want to be able to wipe my own butt when I'm 105. Yeah. Okay. And that, that message implies a lot. One, it implies I'm going to live to 105 to see my great grandchildren and beyond, but I want to be independent. I don't want to be a burden on my family. I want to be healthy and fit all the way to that age. And yes, that means I've got to have the leg strength to squat. I've got to have the dexterity to reach around and do the paperwork. And then I've got to have the leg strength to stand back up. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that are in their sixties that can't do that. Um, and so I don't want to be that individual. I want to be the person that can do everything I want to do. And I own a gym and I can tell you one of the best workouts you can ever have is pulling all the weights and stuff to one side, cleaning a place and then putting them all back and having to do that all over a day and a half, um, <laughs> just to get the gym back in shape. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of things that keep me active. I have a lot of things that I want to do. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to have a setback, but the recovery is important. So the work is important. And if you're going to have a setback, uh, just recognize that now you've changed your path, but you're still going to the same place. Yeah. I love that. That's really good, mate. And just what you said there about the training for longevity, the like Peter Atia, you know him, Dr. Peter Atia. He's a longevity I've heard of him, yeah. doctor. Really, yeah. he's got the Drive podcast, really good podcast. He talks about the Centenarian Olympics and basically, you know, the goals to be able to do certain tasks when you're 100. Pretty much what you said, like being able to squat down. He didn't say wipe your ass, but like basically, <laughs> you know, having the mobility to do that as well. Yeah. Uh, squat down also to be able to put something in an overhead compartment when you're traveling. And also I would be saying like, yeah, balance on one leg would be a big thing. And also ability to get up and down off the ground as well as a huge marker and, uh, and grip strength around, yeah. uh, you know, making you more resilient to falls, which tends to be a massive way. Someone can go downhill very quickly as they age also. Yeah. And, and just simple things like fo focusing on gait. Um, you may notice when you see an older person, uh, they start the little duck walk and the shorter little steps. And the interesting thing is that those movement patterns now make them more likely to fall. Their feet are closer together. They're less willing to take a longer step. Uh, they're more likely to fall sideways, which is where they then break their hip. And the, the stats on people falling over the age of 65 is huge. Mm -hmm. Now, I live in a, in a moist climate, a rainy climate, and I have this rental apartment and twice going down those stairs, I have, I have slipped on that tile and fallen down those stairs and hit the ground and <laughs> slid down the stairs. Now in my fifties, uh, a lot of people would have a broken bone. Mm. Okay. But because I weight train, because I resistance train, I have very dense bones particularly for someone my age. So I'm bruised and embarrassed. I get up and I go about my life. Um, and that's the other side of it is, is making yourself resilient is, is all a part of this. So the vision of everything I talk about, about being the person I'm supposed to be, uh, I love, I have two dogs and it's sort of like a, and we're talking morning routine, but one of my morning routines is actually when my dogs are laying on the floor, I get down on the floor and play with my dogs for about five minutes or so every single morning. Um, and I don't have to worry about having a plan to get back up, which is the joke. You'll hear a lot of older people. If I knew I had to get back up, I wouldn't have got down. Uh, we all sit and that's the other side of it. We all, we all sit in chairs and watch children play on the floor. 
if you want to change a child's life and your relationship with that child, sit down on the floor with that child. Mm -hmm. They don't see adults down there. It's a whole world for them that they don't see. They see you. They're looking up at a chair, a person sitting in a chair. That's where adults sit. Mm -hmm. But sit on the floor and you can, you can change your relationship with a child like that. Being in Panama, do you see locals move well? Like, are there a lot of, is there, you know, versus like where you're from, you're from the U S right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, you versus find the U S absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, obesity is less here. Uh, one of the great things I can say about this, and there, there is no fast food, mm-hmm. none. There's no fast food restaurants. There's one chain restaurant and it's a sushi restaurant and it's above the price point that the locals are going to eat. Now, do the locals eat the healthiest of, of diets? Uh, maybe not, but they don't overeat. That's, that's the other side of it. So uh, chicken, rice, beans, that's their staples uh, for, for this area. And a lot of fruit, lot, lots and lots of fruit and uh, root vegetables. Uh, that's their thing. Uh, but they're, they're not overweight because they don't overeat. And, uh, you know, do they live longer? I, I don't really know, but, um, and are they fitter? Well, again, that's the, that's just, you know, kind of a, a judgment question. Uh, I am thinking about having a, a strongest, strongest person of Bocas competition at the gym. Uh, and then we'll see, uh, who the strongest, but they're, a lot of them are very fit. A lot of them are very strong and very healthy. Um, and yes, a lot of them are making the money, putting the money in investing and coming to a gym. Uh, to get stronger. So, um, but is it better than the United States? I'd say overall, probably, but there are obese Panamanians um, and there are very fit Panamanians. So, mm-hmm. yeah, let, let's talk a bit more about your daily kind of routine, mate. You've got a lot of balls in the air with four different businesses. <laughs> so how do you set up your, your day and your week between, you know, the in-person training, the online training, the podcast, the b and uh, yeah, we'd love to know how you make that all work. <laughs> well, here, here's one of the, here's one of the, the most important things. And it's the most counterintuitive thing is sleep, sleep. Um, if you get good sleep, your brain works better. Your body works better. You have more energy and you actually get more done in less time. Uh, so I try to go to bed around eight thirty nine 9 o'clock every night. I know that's not possible for a lot of people, but it gets dark here. Uh, we're on about a 12 and 12. So there's no big swings of winters, long nights and summers, long days. Uh, they're all about the same because we're closer to the equator. Um, but I try to go to bed about eight thirty nine 9 o'clock every night. And I do not, and I have not for at least the last six years, set an alarm. Unless I have to be at the airport before seven o'clock, I do not set an alarm and I will sleep as long as I need to sleep. So some mornings that means I wake up at five and I feel good. Uh, Some mornings I sleep till nine and I feel good. Um, So I try to make sure that my mornings are my time. They're free. Uh, I don't really try to schedule too many things. I think we scheduled this. It was 10 o'clock my time, but a uh, year later time. So I uh, totally get it. Uh, I, I knew I would be up by 10. Uh, so I think I was up by seven today, but I'll wake up when I wake up. Uh, if I'm the first up, I'll take our dogs out for a walk. Uh, if not, then I come up, I get a, a cup of coffee because we're bed and breakfast. So the coffee's ready at seven. And then I'll go sit down on the floor and say hello to my dogs and we'll have our little pet session and hang out. Uh, then I get up and I come in, um, check my emails. And then I look at what my day is and I block out my, my workout times. Um, I block out my cardio times. I block out my weightlifting times. Uh, the gym I own is closed for siesta for lack of a better word. Uh, we close from noon to three. Um, and so I can go in there during that period of time and I can do my own lifting. I can train people. So if I'm going to train someone, I'll do it while the gym's empty and closed. Um, And so I kind of set myself up with, okay, what's on my calendar? Uh, When will I let people have my time? Uh, Because, you know, I'm not going to let someone schedule something uh, that's going to interfere with those, the the weight training, the cardio work. It's, it's solid. It's, it's, it's the meeting with my boss. Um, And uh, so I'll do that. I don't typically eat in the morning. 
Uh, so the earliest I would eat would be 11 o'clock. And again, that's only if I know, okay, I'm going to train someone that I'm training. Uh, so it would end up being three or four o'clock before I'd get to eat. So I might eat something before I go do that. But, uh, if I had my ruthers, I probably wouldn't eat until about two o'clock in the afternoon. So I have a restricted eating window of say two to seven. Um, and then I'm in bed by eight 30. So, um, there's a lot to do in a day, but, but, you know, if you block out the most important things and then you sit down and you start your day with, okay, beyond petting my dogs, what's my next priority? What's the single most important thing for me to do now? Uh, and you do it and you get it done and then you do the next thing. And so you avoid the multitasking, which slows you down, um, in the long run. Uh, and maybe you're not keeping all the plates spinning. But what I found is they don't always have to be spinning. Um, you, sometimes you can just focus on one thing, like, um, you know, my clients. Uh, today is my, after I get through this the interview, is all client focused. And I'll spend the next hour or two checking in with them, making sure they're where they need to be um, and scheduling any calls that any of them might need and get that done. And then my training. Um, I'll go to the gym. I think today again, I'm scheduled at one o'clock. So the gym will close at 12. I'll be in there at one o'clock um, and I'll do my lifting. Uh, it's a back and bicep day. Um, and I'll probably do a little bit of uh, core work um, and mobility. And then I'll head, it, I'll head home. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a common day. Nice, mate. Yeah, I like the idea of keeping your mornings free. That's something that I would yeah i think that's something that I'll, I'll try and do more of it's just the the time zone can be a bit of a tricky one for me i've got australian clients uh, a lot of clients in australia still so realistically we can only do mornings um but we can you know we can do kind of one right. or two weeks well, out of the and, and but that's what i would say is is have specific days when you're going to work with those clients so they know maybe they know tuesdays and thursdays or monday wednesday fridays are their training days where they're going to have access to you. Uh, so those mornings, obviously, yeah, now that's client time and put a block there. Um, but the other mornings are open or you can flip it and say, my work day ends at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because again, most of your clients would have already been handled and done and now you can focus on you. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Let's talk about the podcast. So when, you know, your podcast is kind of at the level now where it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a real proper podcast and like, <laughs> you know, there's a lot, like a lot of people are doing podcasts, you know, I'm obviously in this category. I started before Christmas and a lot of them fizzle out, but you've been doing this for a long time. You've got a lot of high profile guests on as well, right? Yes. Um, well, like I said, I was out there looking and well, ju was just before you jump in, mate, but just one last part of that question was when did you get to the point where you're like, Oh wow, this is actually a thing now. This is really taking off. It's funny because I actually had had a podcast before uh, and it was with my corporate, the things I was doing in corporate and I, no one was doing a podcast on it. So I started a podcast and I had no idea what I was doing, uh, but I was doing it. And it, it, it was, I thought I was not doing well at all. Um, you know, I did a podcast episode, it got 600 downloads. And I'm like, oh, that's trash. That's terrible. So this time when I went in, I went in a little bit more prepared. He went over the age of 40. Uh, so I started the 40 plus fitness podcast. This was in December of 2015. Um, and so I'm not going to say it's early in podcasting because podcasts have been around for a while, but it was, it was early for this type of podcast. Now, if you look out there, there's, there's three or four or five that are focused on the 40, 50 and above category in the health and fitness space. Uh, but at the time it wasn't. Now I was over ambitious to start. Uh, trying to do five episodes a week um, and, and everything. But that was kind of the cool thing because John Lee Dumas was doing seven days a week and he was killing it. And so everybody's like, well, the more you do, the better. And I found actually that the higher the quality, <laughs> the better. So you don't have to do as many. Uh, I get more downloads just doing one a week than I ever did doing five a week or three a week. Uh, my, my downloads went up as a result of doing less, but doing it better. 
Um, so I started focusing on the quality of my sound. I started focusing on the guests that I was getting. Um, if I have a guest on my podcast, I read their book. So if you could imagine that I've had over 335 guests on my podcast, I've read every single one of their books, cover to cover, to plan and prepare the podcast. So I put in at least 10 hours for every podcast that I do because I read the book. Uh, and, and I can even, you know, and my guests know it because when they come on the show, I can point to things in the book that they never thought anybody would be paying any attention to. And no other inter interviewer is going to talk about like um, one woman, her mother fought off a gorilla to save this little kid. And she said, there's one sentence in her book. And I said, I have to ask the question, tell me the story about your mother and the gorilla. And she got this smile on her face because she was like, Hey, someone's paying attention. And that's if, if I can leave it with any, any life lesson on this thing is people don't people get ignored things about them get ignored. And when you start actually focusing on little things that are important to them, even if it's not important to you, you're going to build a better relationship with that person straight away. So, uh, I like to do that with my guests. And as a result, they, they come off the podcast looking good. Their book looks good. Uh, so they have the promotional platform that they come on a podcast like this to do. So yeah, I've had Tony Horton on, uh, I've had Denise Austin on, um, a, a ton of other ones that are big names. Uh, uh, Dr. Nestor, you know, that does the breathing. Um, oh yeah. James Nestor. Yeah. And, yeah. Very and so, good. you know, yeah, he was on I, Rogan I, as well. Yeah. So I've had, I've had some very good guests come forward. Uh, usually when they have a book coming out. And like I said, I, I dedicate the time to study their book, ask really good questions from the perspective of what is a good takeaway? What is, what is something that you need to know that's in this book? And you can get value out of that podcast, but then you're like, oh, I want to know more. I'm going to buy that book. And so that's my goal with each episode. I do some solo episodes too. Uh, like today I dropped episode 539. Wow. And to the you know, next Monday, I drop a solo episode 540. So about every once in a while, I will do a solo episode. I actually put more time into developing the content for a solo episode than I do for one that involves reading a book because I go to do the research of, okay, this is why I think this, is this still what the current science says? Uh, so I know I'm right, or at least as right as I can be based on what the science says uh, for what I'm trying to get across. And so I, I will do that. Um, and so it's, it's a huge dedication of time, you know, one episode a week, uh, I'm putting in over 10 hours an episode. Um, and I have help. I mean, I have a, someone helping me with the audio just to make sure the quality is the best. I have someone that does, it's a full transcript, um, because I want to be accessible. Uh, some of my clients are blind. Uh, wow. so they love the audio format, but I also recognize that some people out there are deaf and therefore can't hear the audio content. So providing the transcript for them that's slightly edited. You still there, mate? Yeah, sorry about that. I, I I'm not sure. I think it might be might be my side, but um, anyway, I kept talking, so I don't know how much of that they caught. Uh, but you know, just to recap it, yeah, mm -hmm. I've been doing the podcast since December 2015. I have over 539 episodes out there uh, as of this morning. Um, I I do the work, I do the homework to make sure that every episode brings value. So anything that you're gonna do take the time to do it right. You know, don't waste your time doing things halfway. Um, especially with a podcast when there's so much selection out there and you talk about the Joe Rogans and the, those kind of guys and how they got that big, they got that big by being really, really good at what they do and doing it consistently over and over. And you look at your workouts and you say, how do I want to get, how do I get stronger? How do I get faster? How do I lose weight? It's doing good work consistently for the long haul and you get better and better and better. And that's any craft, anything you want to do, even if you're over 40 and you want to get healthy and fit, your body's capable of doing it. If you're consistent and you do good work. 
So true, mate. Let's talk about your uh, maybe certain events that might have shifted your approach to training. I think it might be your shoulder issue, but yeah, would love to hear more about maybe it, how things shifted versus then versus now. Yeah. Well, yeah, the shoulder was probably one of the biggest shifts because it, it made me rethink my paradigm. Uh, I tore my right shoulder uh, rotator cuff. So the question then is how strong, how able is my left um, to be able to go through lifts and do things. So I don't want to tear that one. I'm, I, while Panama has great medical care, I don't have access to the surgeon and the physical therapist that I had uh, when I was in the States. Uh, so if I were to tear it, um, it would be a lot more difficult for me to do, go through a, a proper recovery with it. Um, I could, but I don't want to. So uh, I, I have changed some of my training techniques. I've, I've changed the weights that I use and just recognizing that there is a point of being strong enough. Um, you know, I don't, I need to be able to check my ego uh, and say, okay, that's, that's enough. Uh, you know, I don't need to be stronger that way. Um, I can be stronger in other ways, or I can work on other things. Um, and so that's been probably the biggest shift is recognizing that it's progression is important, but you have to check the ego and you have to know when there's the line to say, okay, I'm strong enough this way. And there's so many other fitness modalities for you to work on. You know, we talked about mobility, balance, um, stamina, speed, um, all those things that I can cycle through those and still really feel like I'm improving on all fronts. And it doesn't have to just be that one modality of strength. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing, like checking the ego, which is, uh, <laughs> for, for guys in particular, I think it's a, it's a difficult one. You get enough slaps in the face and eventually you listen. And this is definitely personal experience for me. And also I like to recommend people to try like a skill-based approach, kind of like what you're saying, there's different ways to progress. So instead of just adding more weight to the bar, you can focus on, if you're using like a shoulder press, as an example, you can start focusing on like an inverted press, which is kind of like a variation of a handstand push-up, which would be, you know, another way to train your shoulders, but it's really technically difficult and challenging, but it's not going to put as much, you know, weight and stress on the shoulder girdle going forwards. Yeah. So let's talk about maybe something you've changed your mind on recently in the last, let's say, six to 12 months. Well, probably the biggest one is this. You know, I, I've always been this proponent of the 80-20 rule is a lie. Um, if you're 80-20, if you're which you, a lot of people believe, like, oh, just if you're good 80% of the time, you're going to see change. And I would say if you're 25 years old, yeah, probably. When you're over 40, I've noticed that that's, that tended to not be as true. And then I also noticed that people don't know math um, <laughs> or maths, uh, you know, because they'll say, how, how was your week? And a, a typical client will tell me, well, I was really good Monday through Friday. And then, you know, afterwards I went out to the pub and had a few beers with my friends and then we had some pizza and then Saturday, yeah, we picked up, we, we did this thing, you know, went out there playing a sport and drinking beer and, and we had a barbecue and, you know, on and on and on. And then Sunday, you know, well, I had dinner with my folks and, the, you know, and you go through and say, okay, so the weekend, they're like, yeah, I just, just screwed up the weekend. I'm like, okay, well, that's closer to 40, 43% uh, of your week and not 20. Um, and so they're not seeing the progress or they only make, you know, 80% of their workouts and the ones they're skipping are the ones that are really the most critical for them. Cause they, I've, I've one client, he, he loves running. So on the days he has to do cardio, he's, he's in heaven. He hates the resistance training and, and I want him to love it. Uh, we're working on that, but he'll skip the resistance training. So he'll tell me he did 80% of his training program but it's not the 20% that he needed. You know, he skips yeah. the 20% that is really what's holding him back physically. And he's focused on the thing that he loves, which is fine, but he's not going to get where he wants to be the, the, the end goal, the vision of what he's after. And so I've always thought that the 80, 20 rule was, uh, was a myth. It was, it was, it was only there as a maintenance tool uh, later, but 
lately I've talked to a few psychiatrists uh, on the show and, you know, they are, they're a little bit more holistic about this whole balance of life and things. And I, and I get it, you know? Um, so I, I think I have the mindset of all or nothing. I have the mindset of, okay, if I set my mind to something, I'm going to do it. And so I can like get in the Porsche and just sprint down the highway. Uh, there's nothing between me and the end goal. I can just choo, fly. Uh, and I can do that for an extended period of time, but not everybody's wired that way. Some people really struggle with feeling like, uh, this is too hard. I can't do this this way, or they're saddled with other things. So instead they, they have to take a lorry because they got a lot of baggage to carry and they're not going to be able to go as fast as the, as the Porsche. And, and so they're, and they're going to have more turns and they're going to have more obstacles and they're going to have more detours just because of their lifestyle. And so recognizing that your path has to fit your lifestyle. So life is not in the way life is the way, because if, if you have a birthday party that you go to, you're, you're going to go to another one next year. Um, you know, the, the, these things tend to happen again. Uh, so, so you true. say you screwed up because it was my birthday and they were buying shots and it's like, okay, well, great. That's cool. Guess what? You're going to have another one and another one. <laughs> and so how, how do we go through the process of sprinting when we can driving slower when we need to, so that we're responsibly moving ourselves toward our vision, but we're doing it in a way that's responsive to it. So this the concept of self-awareness and me recognizing, okay, not everybody can be in the Porsche to get to their goal. Not everyone can get there that fast or that directly. Uh, and coming up with that self-awareness and then having the patience and the persistence to stick with it, knowing you. And so you might need be someone who I, I don't want to give up having beers with my buddies at the pub on Friday night, that is, that's a part of my lifestyle. And I don't want to give that up. And so you making a commitment, but it's kind of the same thing of you make a commitment to your wife, you get married and you tell her, you know, even when we're married, I still want to go out on Friday night and have beers with my friends at the pub. And she's going to, like, she knows you and she's okay with it. And you know, if you talk about that before you get married. Sure. Uh, but you made the commitment to her that you're going out and still doing something that you did when you were younger versus saying, I'm married to you. We go together. I, I'm going to get rid of friends that don't suit my, my new lifestyle. People do that, but it's not sustainable and they start having problems. And so it's the same thing with your, with your diet, same thing with your exercise. If you try to take on something that's unsustainable for a long time, you're going to probably fail. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of one of the realizations I've come to in about the last year is that most people probably can't be 95% on for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. they, they've got to go slower. They've got to take their time. Um, and that's just a, a new perspective I've have with my clients, with myself um, and recognize, cause you know, again, when I injured myself, it was like, okay, what can I do? I, I was still going to the gym every single day. Um, I was doing my therapy and then I was like, okay, I can do, I can do leg press, you know, I can do the leg machines particularly. So I was in the gym three days a week doing heavy legs just cause that's all I could do. Um, and then when my shoulder got strong enough, which I got through therapy way faster than was planned, uh, which was good because it was $350 per session. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so finishing up about three weeks early was actually, uh, fiscally a good idea. Um, but it was, it was the concept I want to get back and I want to be, be doing the things I want to do, but I'm an all or nothing person and not everybody's wired that way. So if you're a trainer, talk to your client about their self-awareness. Are you an all or none? Are you a moderation person? What are the things that are going to, that always come up in your life? They're not, they're not one-offs. Birthdays are not one-offs. Um, Christmas is not one-off. Uh, in the United States, football season is not one off. So uh, I, I eat keto most of the time, um, but I take breaks from keto. And typically that was around college football season, American football in the United States. I love going tailgating. I love hanging out with my friends. I love having some beers. So I knew there was a period of time, which runs roughly from September to February, 
uh, when, when that season's going on. And so I go off of keto, I call it my feasting season and I'm comfortable, you know, with, with that. And then when it's time for me to be on, like right now is one of those times I got to turn on because I need to be strong enough to, and, and fast enough and able to do a tough mutter in about three more months. Yeah, you made a really good point there. I think as a coach, you can kind of sometimes think, well, I love doing this and I, this is my career. I live it, I breathe it. Everyone should be like me. Whereas clients, it's like a little, you know, it's like a little percentage of their lives. It's not their entire lives. And especially yeah, if you're going to type A and I think if you're running your own business, you know, you've moved country, it's like, it's a more maybe, not, maybe not an extreme personality, but like is in when you put your mind to something, you clearly do it. You don't talk about it. So not everyone's like that. And yeah, I think that's the, the art of coaching is being able to help people, I guess, tap into what they're good at and leverage that side of things, whether they're, you know, all in or they want to do a little bit at a time, but really meeting the client where they're at. Right. And then helping set the expectations of what that actually means. You know, so if, if they're expecting to come in and they're going to be half on and half off, uh, then they're not going to see a PR in the gym every week mm -hmm. versus the guy who comes in and really pushes every exercise really hard. Sometimes they're PR, PRing their bench press. Sometimes they're PRing their squat, but they're seeing regular progress because they're working so hard. There are mm -hmm. clients that can do that. And there are other clients that are going to come in and say, you know, I'm, I can't push that hard. I need more rest. Uh, oh, the baby's sick. I got to take them to the clinic and I can't make our workout. It's like, okay, cool. Um, you know, here's something you can do at home, but it's not going to have the same benefit as what we were doing in the gym. And you know, that that's their lifestyle. That's the, the, they've got to drive the lorry and they can't drive the Porsche. Mm, yeah. 100%. All right, mate, let's move into some rapid fire questions to finish off. So first one is ideal dinner date. Someone you'd like to sit down for two or three hours and just pick their brain over dinner. Uh, I, I, got, I put a lot of thought into this because there's a lot of names. Uh, Joe Rogan was on that list. He was in, he was in my top three, actually. <laughs> uh, Mike Rowe was on that list. But number one would be Dan Carlin. And Dan Carlin oh, is the host hardcore of Hardcore History. history. Yeah. yeah, Hardcore yeah. History. That show is so well researched. This guy is so well read. Um, it, I, I could probably, and again, each of his episodes, they're, they're monumental, like four hours, and there's like series of five shows. So you're, it's like an audio book, uh, in-depth audio book when you, when you download like five episodes of his shows, like 20 hours. And, but that said, he knows this stuff inside and out, and he's read so many different sources. So I could probably spend every dinner date with him and, and never get bored with the conversations we were having. Yeah. That's a really, really good guest. Okay. Next. What are you most grateful for and why? I'm, I'm grateful for my health. You know, uh, I've, Facebook has made it to where you can stay connected to everybody you went to high school with and grade school with and every school with, I mean, you, you're, you're catching up with people that we didn't, we didn't have anything like this 20 years ago. Uh, I don't know that a lot of people don't know Facebook is not even 20 years old because um, a lot of people just grew up with Facebook. I'm a teenager. I get Facebook and then I stay on Facebook. But for us, I'm now I'm seeing people that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and I see the aging curve. And it's downhill. It's downhill fast. Um, and, you know, it's like when you were, when you were getting older, there was like, you had gravity pushing you down the hill or keeping you down the hill. So you weren't aging so fast, but then you go over to the top of that hill and now the gravity is pulling you down to old age. And if you're not doing the right things to, to change, um, then you go down that curve really fast. And I, I have to say for my age, for what I'm capable of doing, um, I'm just so grateful that I have the body I have, that it's capable of improving itself if I condition it right and I eat right and I sleep right and I manage stress, which my whole lifestyle is built around. That's why I live in the Caribbean. That's why I don't set an alarm in the morning. Uh, that's why I intermittent fast and I own a gym. Uh, you know, I'm trying to touch all those bases to say, how do I make sure I'm successful in each of these realms? Uh, and my body rewards me for it. Yeah, mate, definitely I think health is, is number one. If that's out, then yeah, it doesn't really matter what else is going on. Next is 
what would be your superpower if you could wake up tomorrow? So this is a true super. If it was a superpower, then I want to be able to fly. Um, <laughs> Because I live on an island, and to get anywhere, we have to travel to Panama, then take a uh, taxi over to another airport. And because the flights don't always work out well, you end up spending a night there, and then you fly. So getting back to the United States is a two-day venture. Uh, Getting back here is a two-day venture. Uh, So a one-week trip is kind of almost a waste uh, because you only get four days uh, in country. So uh, if I could fly then it would make my life a lot easier because I could just get there and uh, be everywhere I wanted to be. I could be watching the college football or, or actually our, our, our baseball team at this college I root for is, is doing really well this year. So I could be up there uh, tomorrow uh, to watch them kick off the, uh, the championship tournament. Um, and then I could fly back, you know, but uh, so yeah, flying. <laughs> from, uh, from the main city, how long is it to the U.S.? from Panama. Uh, like well, if you fly to Miami, it's like three, three and a half hours. Oh, wow. So it's really close. That's and we're in the same time zones as them. So it's, yeah, it's, it's actually really convenient once you're in the city, but it's just the fact that we're over here and there's only one airline that services us and the bus, if you go over, you take a boat and then you take the bus, the bus is 12 hours. So, um, <laughs> driving through Panama is not, not the easiest, but it's a one hour flight. But again, timing the flight to get there, make it to the other airport and get on that plane is, is often difficult. So to not stress myself, I would, I have to book, I book an overnight. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Book or books that you've gifted the most, maybe let's talk about, cause you've read a lot, man. So let's talk about a, you know, health, fitness, longevity related book and a fictional book. Okay. Um, if, if I were going to give, cause I don't, I, I don't give a lot of health and fitness books away. I wrote one. Um, I I've given a lot of those away. Uh, so the wellness roadmap is the one that I wrote. Um, and, and a lot of things we talked about today are, are in that book. Um, uh, but you know, there are a lot of great books out there. Uh, probably top on my list right now is one I just read. It's just coming out. Uh, that episode is going live in about two weeks, but Alan Aragon, who you may know from bodybuilder.com. He has a new book coming out. It's called flexible dieting, but it's not really about flexible dieting. It's about optimal performance nutrition. So if you want to know what to eat, to get stronger, to be faster, or to have a better physique, this book is soup to nuts. One of the best I've ever read uh, on that, particularly on that topic. So the the topic, the title is flexible dieting, but it's, that's really a small portion of the book. It's his book's really about optimal performance and nutrition. So uh, that's the book I would recommend and, and be giving away right now because it's so topical and, and, and new. Uh, but if you ask me about the book that I've actually given away the most, there's two. Uh, one is Influence by Robert, Robert Caldini, Dr. Caldini, Robert Caldini. Yeah. Um, that if, if you want to build good relationships with people, that book or the Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, are probably the two that I've given away the most on that topic. And then the other one that I've given away a lot, and this is more my corporate life is who moved my cheese. And this is by Dr. Spencer Johnson. And it's a quick little book, but it's, it's for any group or any people going through change, or we're all going through change all the time, just going back to that book and recognizing the feelings you're having are, are okay. They're, they're a part of the change process. And so going through the book, it kind of gives you this little parable of the mice and the moving of the cheese and how they're dealing with that change. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to do the self-reflection and it makes it easier to go through change. So those are the books that I tend to give away the most. Very good. Yeah. Alan Aragon for people listening is probably one of, if not the most kind of respected evidence-based kind of nutritional researchers in the world are, yeah. Yes, it will be definitely yeah. one of the top three to five. And, and my episode will be coming out, uh, I guess, uh, these days what we're, uh, be, I think the first week of June, first week of cool. June, so about June 7th or something like that, that episode should be hitting at 40 plus fitness. Great. Great. I'll check it out. Okay. Last question. If you could put something on a billboard to meet, to reach millions, if not billions of people, what would you write and why? Okay. I would say be kind to yourself and others. I think a lot of times we're not kind to ourselves. We're probably meaner to ourselves than we are to others. Uh, We treat others better. And uh, so I think being kind to yourself, being your own best friend, 
So the, the, that negative voice you have in your head and the stuff it says to you, you would never say to your best friend. You would never say it to your child. You'd never say it to your significant other. Um, those words are hurtful and you need to be kind to yourself and recognize that all of us are going through struggles. And so just a little bit more kindness to yourself and to others is how we all change this world. Lovely. That's a really good message to end the podcast on mate. So really appreciate you taking time out of your, your morning. Cause I know now that your mornings are sacred, which is great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, where, where can people learn more about you? Obviously the podcast and everything. I will link all this in the show notes as well, but let's just uh, send people where's the, where's the best place to find more about you. Okay. Uh, you can go to 40 plus fitness uh, And that's where you'll find my main podcast page. I'm also on all all platforms. So Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeart, Amazon, Audible. I'm everywhere you can listen to a podcast practically. You should be able to find me there. 40 plus fitness podcast. And then you can go to 40 plus fitness.com. And that's my training platform. That's, that's where I offer training. Uh, I don't carry a lot of clients. Um, I don't want to be this big guy that has thousands of clients. I want a handful of people that I want to work with, that want to work with me, that want to make real change. Uh, so that's what I do. I, I don't bring on a lot of clients. I don't have an open enrollment where I just bring in a bunch of people. Um, it's handpicked clients that come in and say, okay, I want to work with you. We get on the phone and determine if I'm the right trainer for them. And if we do, then we move forward. But I, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I don't take a lot of clients and I don't want stress. So I don't take a lot of clients, but for the clients that I do take, um, they get personal, they get to know me, uh, and I get to know them and all these things we talked about, self-awareness, patience, persistence, accountability, you know, that's, that's a part of what I bring, uh, to this. So, uh, if you're interested in learning, uh, the podcast is great. Like I said, 540 episodes or 539 episodes at this point. Uh, each episode right now runs about 45 minutes. So I think that'll keep you busy for the next year. Uh, if you want to go listen to the back catalog, there's some cool ones. Uh, Tony Horton was one of my favorite interviews. Uh, Alan Aragon, and that one that's coming up is a really great interview. Um, but that's, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome, mate. Appreciate you taking the time again. And we'll chat again soon. All right. Thank you.